So um, welcome back everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, I hope you had a good week and uh, had a fun time playing around with artistic style. Um, I know I did. Um, I thought I'd show you. So I tried a couple of things myself uh, over the week with this artistic style stuff. Um, just a, I just tried a couple of simple little um, changes which I thought you might be interested in. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh actually, yeah, okay. So. One thing before I talk about the artistic style is I just wanted to point out some of the really cool stuff that people have been contributing um, over the over the week. Um, if you haven't uh, come across it yet, be sure to check out the um, the wiki. Uh, so the uh, there's a nice thing in Discourse where you can basically set any post as be being a wiki, which means that anybody can edit it. So I created this wiki post early on, and by the end of the week we now have um, all kinds of stuff with uh, links to the stuff from the class. A summary of the paper, um, examples, um, a list of all the links, um, both snippets, uh, a handy list of steps that are, are kind of necessary when you're doing style transfer, um, lots of stuff about the TensorFlow Dev Summit, and so forth. So keep an eye out, we'll have one of these um, wiki threads every week. Um, so look out for that. Um, lots of other threads. Uh, one I saw just this afternoon popped up, which was great from um, Chin Chin. Um, uh, why is it still going through? Um, talked about trying to summarize um, what they've learned from lots of other threads across the wiki. And this is really sorry across the forum. This is a great thing that we can all do. Is you know when you look at lots of different things and kind of take some notes. Um, if you put them on the forum for everybody else, um, this is super handy. Um, so if you haven't quite caught up on all the stuff going on the forum, um, looking at this curating lesson 8 experiments thread would be probably a good place to start. Um, so a uh, couple of little changes I made in my experiments. Uh, I tried thinking about like why um, well, uh, quite a few of you pointed out how depending on what your starting point is for your um, optimizer, you get to a very different place. Um, and so clearly our um, convex optimization um, is uh, not necessarily finding a local minimum, but at least saddle points that it's not getting out of. So I tried something which was to create a, um, take the random image and just add a Gaussian blur to it. Uh, so Gaussian filter is just a blur, and so that makes the random image into this kind of thing. And I just found that um, even the plain style looked a lot smoother. Um, so that was one change that I made, which I thought worked quite well. Um, another change that I made just to play around with it was I added a different weight to each of the style layers. Um, and so my, my zip now has a third thing in, which is the weights, and I just multiply by the weight. Um, so I thought that those two things made my little bird look a significantly better than my little bird looked before, so I was happy with that. Um, you could do a similar thing for content loss. You could um, also maybe add more different layers of content loss and give them different weights as well. I'm not sure if anybody's tried that um, as yet. Um, um, uh, yes, Rachel? A question? I have a question in regards to style transfer for cartoons. With cartoons, when we think of transferring the style, what we really mean is transferring the contours of the cartoon to redraw, to redraw the content in that style. Um, this is not what style transferring is doing here. How might one implement this? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that anybody's quite figured that out, but I'll show you a couple of directions that may be useful. Okay. Um, let me just finish the idea. I've tried selecting activations correspond with edges and such as indicated by one of the con visualization papers and comparing outputs from specifically those activations. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I'll show you some things. I'll show you some things you could try. Um, I haven't seen anybody do a great job of this yet, but here's, I mean, here's one example from the from the forum is somebody pointed out that this, this cartoon approach didn't work very well with Dr. Seuss, but then when they changed their initial image not to be random but to be the picture of the dog, it actually looked quite a lot better. Um, so there's one thing you could try. Um, there's some very helpful diagrams um, that some, uh, somebody posted, which is fantastic, just summarizing what we learned. Um, I liked this uh, summary of what happens if you add versus remove each layer. So this is what happens if you remove um, block 0, block 1, block 2, block 3, and block 4 to get a sense of how they um, impact things. So you can see for the style that the last layer is really 
uh, important to making it look good, at least with this image. Um, uh, one of you had some particularly nice examples. Uh, I love this. Like, it, it seems like there's a certain taste to kind of figuring out what photos go with what images. I thought this Einstein was terrific. I thought this was terrific as well. Um, uh, Brad uh, came up with this really interesting insight that starting with this picture and adding a style to it creates this uh, extraordinary uh, shape here where, where, as he points out, you can tell it's a man sitting in the corner, but there's like less than 10 brush strokes. So sometimes this style transfer does things which are surprisingly fantastic. Um, I have no idea what this is even in the photo, so I don't know what it is in the painting either, but I guess I don't watch that kind of music enough. Um, so there's uh, lots of interesting ideas you can try, and I've got a link here in the, um, you might have seen it in the PowerPoint, to uh, a Keras implementation that has a whole list of things that you can try. Um, and uh, here are some particular um, examples. Um, this is something called, uh, and all of these examples you can get the details from this uh, link. Um, there's something called chain blurring, um, and for some things, this, is, this might work well for cartoons. Notice how the matrix doesn't do a good job with the cat when you use the, they call it classic, this is our paper, right? Um, but if you use this chain blurred approach, it does a fantastic job. And so I wonder if that might be one secret to the cartoons. Um, some of you I saw in the forum have already tried this, which is using color preservation and uh, luminance matching, which basically means you're still taking the style, but you're not taking the color. And I think in these particular examples, this is really great results. I think it depends a lot on what, what things you tried with. Um, you can go a lot further. Um, for example, you can add a mask and then say just do color preservation for one part of the photo. So here the top part of the photo has got color preservation and the bottom hasn't. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, they even show uh, in that um, code how you can uh, use a mask to say one part of my image should not be stylized. Um, again, getting some good results. Um, well, this is really crazy. Use masks to decide which one of two style images to use, and then you can really generate some creative stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that you can play with, and you can go beyond this to coming up with your own ideas. Now, some of the best stuff um, you're going to learn a bit more today about how to do some of these things better, um, but just to give an idea, if you go to likemo.net, you can literally draw something using four colors and then choose a style image and it will turn your drawing into an image. Uh, basically the idea being that blue is going to be water and green is going to be foliage and I guess red is going to be um, foreground. Um, so that's, there's a lot of good examples of this kind of um, neural doodle, they call it online. Um, something else we'll learn more about how to do better today is um, if you go to affinelayer.com, there's a very recent paper called pix to pix um, which is basically, we're going to be learning quite a bit in this class about how to do segmentation, which is where you take a photo and turn it into a colored image basically saying the horse is here, the bicycle's here, the person's here. This is basically doing the opposite. You start by drawing something, saying I want you to create something that has a window here and a windowsill here and a door here and a column there and it generates a photo, um, which is fairly remarkable. Um, so the stuff we've learned so far won't quite get you to do these two things, but by the end of today we should be able to. Um, this is a nice example that I think um, some folks at Adobe built, showing that you could basically draw something and it would try and generate an image that was close to your drawing where you just needed a small number of lines. Um, again, you can find this uh, well, we'll link to this paper um, from the resources, um, and this actually shows it to you in real time. So you can see that there's this, th there's some new way of doing art that's starting to appear where you don't necessarily need a whole lot of technique. Uh, I'm not promising it's going to turn you into a Van Gogh, but you can at least generate images that maybe are in your head in some style that's somewhat similar to somebody else's. Um, I think it's really interesting. Okay. Um, one thing I was thrilled to see is that um, at least two of you have already written um, blog posts on Medium. Um, that was fantastic to see. Uh, so I hope more of you might try to do that this week. 
um, definitely doesn't need to be something that takes a long time. Um, and um, um, I know some of you are already plan also planning on turning your forum posts into blog posts, uh, so hopefully we'll see a lot more blog posts this week um, popping up. Uh, I know the people who have done that have found that a useful experience as well. So, um, so um, one of the things that I uh, suggested doing um, pretty high on the list of priorities for this week's uh, assignment was to go through the paper knowing what it's going to say. You know, I think this is really helpful, is when you already know how to do something, is to go back over that paper, and this is a great way to learn how to read papers, right? Because you already know what it's telling you. Um, this is like the way I um, learned to read papers was totally this method. Um, so I've kind of gone through and I, 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 I've highlighted a few key things which I, as I went through, I thought were kind of important. So in the abstract of the paper, um, but let me ask, so how many people kind of went back and, and re-looked at this paper again? Quite a few of you, that's great. Um, so in the abstract they basically say what is it that they're introducing? So it's a system based on a deep neural network that creates artistic images of high perceptual quality. Okay, so we're going to read this paper and hopefully at the end of it we'll know how to do that. Um, then in the first section um, they tell us about the basic ideas. So when CNNs are trained on object recognition, they developed a representation of an image. Um, along the processing hierarchy of the network, it's transformed into representations that increasingly care about the actual content compared to the pixel values. So it describes the basic idea of content loss. Um, then they describe the basic idea of style loss, um, which is looking at the correlations between the different filter responses over the spatial extent of the feature maps. And this is one of these sentences that read on its own doesn't mean very much, um, but now that you know how to do it, you can read it and be like, oh, okay, I, I think I see what that means. And then when you get to the methods section, we learn more. Um, so the idea here is that by including the feature correlations, and this answers one of the questions that one of you had on the forum, by including feature correlations of multiple layers, we obtain a multi-scale representation of the input image. This idea of a multi-scale representation is something we're going to be coming across a lot, because a lot of this, um, as we discussed last week, a lot of this class is about um, generative models, and one of the tricky things with generative models is both to get the kind of um, the general idea of the thing you're trying to generate correct, but also get all the details correct. And so the details generally requires you to zoom into a small scale, and getting the kind of the big picture correct is about zooming out to a large scale. So this was one of the key things that they did in this paper, was show how to create a style representation that included multiple resolutions. And we know, now know that the way they did that was to use multiple style layers, and as we go through the layers of EGG, they gradually become lower and lower resolution, larger and larger receptive fields. Um, always great to look at the figures and make sure, and I was thrilled to see that some of you were trying to recreate these figures, which actually turned out to be slightly non-trivial. Um, so we can see exactly what that figure is, and if you haven't tried it for yourself yet, you might want to try it, see if you can recreate this figure. Um, okay. It's good to try and find in a paper the key finding, you know, the key, um, the key thing that they're showing. In this case, they found that representations of content and style in a CNN are separable, and you can manipulate both to create new new images. Okay, so again, hopefully that now you can look at that and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, you can see that with papers, certainly with this paper, there's often quite a lot of introduction that often says the same thing a bunch of different ways. Um, so it's often worth, you know, the first time you read it, one paragraph might not make sense, but later on they say it in a different way and it starts to make more sense. So it's worth looking through the introductory remarks maybe two or three times. Um, they can certainly see they're again talking about the different layers um, and how they behave. Um, Right, again, showing um, uh, the results of some experiments. So again, you can see if you could recreate these experiments, make sure that you understand how to do it. Um, 
And then there's a kind of a whole lot of stuff I didn't find that interesting um, until we get to the section called methods. So the methods section is the section that hopefully you'll learn the most about reading papers after you've implemented something by reading the section called methods. And I want to show you a few little tricks of notation. Um, you do need to be careful of little details that fly by, like here, they used average poorly. Okay, so that's a sentence which if you weren't reading carefully, you could skip over it. Uh, now we know, okay, we need to use average poorly, not max poorly. So they will often have a section which explicitly says, now I'm going to introduce the notation. Um, this paper doesn't. This paper just kind of introduces the notation as part of the discussion. But at some point you'll start getting um, Greek letters or um, you know things with subscripts or whatever, notation starts appearing. And so at this point you need to start looking very carefully, and at least for me I find I have to go back and read something many times to remember what's L, what's M, what's M. Okay? This is the annoying thing with um, math notation is they're single letters, they generally don't have any kind of mnemonic. Um, often though you'll find that across papers in a particular field, they'll tend to reuse the same kind of English and Greek letters for the same kinds of things. Right? So M will generally be the number of rows, um, capital M. Capital N will often be the number of columns. Um, um, K will often be the index that you're summing over, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so here we've got um, the first thing which is introduced is x with an arrow on top. So x with an arrow on top means it's a vector, right? Um, it's actually an input image, um, but they're going to turn it into a vector by flattening it out. Um, so okay, so our image is called x. And then the CNN has a whole bunch of layers, and every time you see something with a subscript or a superscript like this, you need to look at both of the two bits, because they've both got a meaning. Right? The, thing, the big thing is like the main object. So in this case, a capital N is a filter, and then the subscript or superscript is like uh, in, a, in an array um, or a tensor. In Python, it's like the thing in square brackets. Right? So each filter has um, a letter L, which is like which number of the filter is it. And so often as I read a paper, I'll actually try to write code as I go and like put little comments so that I'll like write um, layer, square bracket, layer number, close square bracket, and then I have a comment after, say like ML, you know, just to remind myself. So I'm creating the code and mapping it to the letters. So there are NL filters. We know from a CNN that each filter creates a feature map, so that's why there are NL feature maps. So remember, anytime you see the same letter, it means the same thing um, within a paper, not necessarily across papers. Uh, each feature map is of size M, and as I mentioned before, N tends to be rows and M tends to be columns. So here it says M is the height times the width of the feature map. So here we can see, okay, they've, they've done dot flatten, basically, to make it all one row. Um, Okay, now this is another piece of notation you'll see all the time. Uh, a layer L can be stored in a matrix called F, and now the L has gone to the top. Doesn't matter, same basic idea, it's just an index. Um, so the matrix F is going to contain our activations. And this thing here where it says R with a little superscript, this has a very special meaning. Um, it's referring to basically what is the, the shape of this. So when you see this uh, shape it says these are R means that they're floats. Um, and this thing here means it's a matrix. You can see the X, so it means it's rows by columns. So there are N rows and M columns in this matrix, and every matrix, there's one matrix for each layer, and there's a different number of rows and different number of columns for each layer. Okay? So you can basically go through and map it to the code that you've already written. Um, so I'm not going to read through the whole thing, um, but there's not very much here, um, and it'd be good to make sure that you understand uh, all of it, um, perhaps with the exception of the derivative, because we don't care about derivatives because they get done for us, thanks to Theano and TensorFlow. So you can always skip the bits about derivatives. Um, okay, so then they do the same thing basically describing the um, Gram matrix. So they show here that the basic idea of the Gram matrix is that they create uh, an inner product between the vectorized feature map i and j. So vectorized here means turned into a vector, 
So the way you turn a matrix into a vector is flattened. This means the flattened the inner product between the flattened feature maps to so those matrices we saw. Um, yeah, so hopefully you'll find this helpful. Um, you'll see there'll be like small little differences. Um, so uh, rather than um, taking the mean, uh, they tend to they use here the sum, and then they kind of uh, divide back out the number of uh, rows and columns to kind of create the mean this way. In our code, we actually put the division inside the sum. Um, so you see these little differences of, of how we implement things. Um, and sometimes you may see, see actual meaningful differences, and that's often a suggestion of like, oh, there's something you could try, you know, some differences you can try. Um, okay, so that describes the, the notation and the method, and that's it. Right? Um, but then very importantly is throughout this, any time you come across some concept which you're not familiar with, um, it'll pretty much always have a, um, a reference, a citation. Right? So you'll see there's um, uh, little numbers all over the place. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing these references. Um, but anytime you come across something which has a citation, like it's a new piece of uh, notation or a new concept, you don't know what it is, generally the first time I see it in a paper, I ignore it. Right? But if I keep reading and it turns out to be something that actually is important and I can't understand the basic idea at all, I generally then put this paper aside, I put it in my to-read file, and make the new paper I'm reading the thing that it's citing. Because like very often a paper is entirely meaningless until you've read one or two of the key papers it's based on. Sometimes this can be like reading the dictionary if you don't yet know English, it can be like layer upon layer of citations, and at some point you have to stop. Um, I generally find, you I think you should find that the basic set of papers that things refer to is pretty much all stuff you guys know at this point, so I don't think you're going to get stuck in an infinite loop. Um, but if you ever do, um, um, you know, let, let, let us know on the forum and we'll try and help you get unstuck. Um, or if there's any notation you don't understand, let us know. Another of the horrible things about math is it's very hard to search for. You know, it's not like you can take that function name and search for Python in the function name instead of some weird squiggly shape. Um, so again, feel free to ask um, if you're not sure about that. Um, there is a great Wikipedia page which lists, uh, I think it's just called notate out math notation or something, which lists pretty much every piece of notation. Um, there are various places you can look up notation as well. Okay, so that's the paper. Um, so let's let's move to the next step. Um, so I think what I might do is kind of try and draw the basic idea of what we did before so that I can draw the idea of what we're going to do differently this time. So previously, and now this thing is actually calibrated, you'll be pleased to hear, we had an, a random image, and we had a loss function. So it doesn't matter what the loss function was, right? We know that it happened to be a combination of style loss plus content loss, right? And what we did was we um, took our image, and our random image, and we put it through this loss function, and we got out of it two things. One was the loss, and the other was the gradients. And then we used the gradients with respect to the original pixels to change the original pixels. Right? And so we basically repeated that loop again and again. Uh, and the pixels gradually change to make the loss um, go down. So that's the basic approach that we just used. Um, it's a perfectly fine approach for what it is, and in fact, for if you are wanting to do lots of different photos with lots of different styles, like if you created a web app where you said, please upload any style image and any content image, here's your artistic styled version, this is probably still the best, particularly with some of those tweaks I talked about. But what if you wanted to create a web app that was a 
Van Gogh irises generator. Upload any image and I will give you that image in the style of Van Gogh's irises. You can do better than this approach, um, and the reason you can do better is that we can do something where you don't have to do a whole optimization run in order to create that output. Instead, we can train a CNN to learn to output photos in the style of Van Gogh's irises. And the basic idea is very similar. Um, what we're going to do this time is we're going to have lots of images. Right? And we're going to take each image and we're going to feed it into the exact same loss function that we used before. Right? With the style loss plus the content loss. Right? But we're going to use, um, for the style loss, we're going to use Van Gogh's irises. And for the content loss, we're going to use the image that we're currently looking at. We've got lots of images we're going to go through. And what we do is we're going to, rather than changing the pixels of the original um, photo, instead what we're going to do is we're going to train a CNN, so a whole bunch of layers of a CNN. We're going to train a CNN to take this, um, I think the best way to show you this, let's move this out of the way. Yeah, that's better. So let's put a CNN in the middle. These are the layers of the CNN, right? And we're going to try and get that CNN to um, spit out a new image. So there's an input image and there's an output image. And this new CNN we've created is going to spit out um, an output image that when you put it through this loss function, Hopefully, it's going to give a, a small number, and if it gives a small number, it means that the content uh, of this photo still looks like the original photo's content, and the style of this new image looks like the style of Van Gogh's irises. So if you think about it, when you have a CNN, you can really pick any loss function you like, right? And we've tended to use some pretty simple loss functions so far, like um, mean squared error or um, cross, cross entropy. Um, in this case, we're going to use a very different loss function, which is going to be um, style plus content loss using the same approach that we used just before. Right? And because that was generated by a neural net, we know it's differentiable. And you can optimize any loss function as long as the loss function is differentiable. So if we now basically take the gradients of this output, not with respect to the input image, but with respect to the CNN weights. And we can take those gradients and use them to update the weights of the CNN, so that the next iteration through, the CNN will be slightly better at turning that image into a picture that has a good style match with Van Gogh's irises. Does that make sense? So at the end of this, we run this through lots of images, just, we're just training a regular CNN, and the only thing we've done differently is to replace the loss function with the style loss plus content loss um, that we just used. And so at the end of it, we're going to have a CNN that has learnt to take any photo and will spit out that photo in the style of Van Gogh's irises. And so this is a win, because it means now in your web app, which is your Van Gogh irises generator, you now don't have to run an optimization path on the new photo, you just do a single forward pass through a CNN, which is instant. Yes, green box over there. Um, so this is going to limit the filters you use, right? Significantly, if you, like, let's say you have Photoshop and you want to change multiple styles. Yeah, this is going to, this is going to, each neural network is going to learn to do just one type of styling. Is there a way of, like, combining multiple styles, or is it just going to be a combination of all You styles? can combine multiple styles by just, like, having multiple bits of style loss for multiple images, but you're still going to have the problems that that network has only learned 
to create one kind of image. Right? It hasn't learned. Now, it may be possible to create to train it so that it takes both a style image and a content image, but I don't think I've seen that done yet, as far as I know. Okay. That's a great question. <clears throat> Having said that, there is something simpler and, in my opinion, more useful we can do. Which is, rather than doing style loss plus content loss, let's think of another interesting problem to solve, which is called super-resolution. Super-resolution is something which, honestly, when Rachel and I started playing around with it a while ago, nobody was that interested in it. Um, but in the last year or so, it's become really hot. Yes, Rachel? Uh, it was less than a year ago that it, nobody was Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we were kind of playing around with it quite a lot. We thought it was really interesting, but suddenly it's got hot. Um, and the basic idea of super resolution is that you start off with a low res photo. And so the reason I started getting interested in this was I wanted to help my mum take her family photos that were often pretty low quality and blow them up into something that was big and high quality that she could print out. So that's what you do: is you try to take something which starts with a small low res photo and turns it into a big high-res photo. LR low-res, HR high-res. Now perhaps you can see that we can use a very similar technique for this. What we could do is between the low-res photo and the high-res photo, we could introduce a CNN. Right, and what that C and that CNN could look a lot like the CNN from our last idea, um, but it's taking in as input a low res uh, uh, image, and then it's sticking it into a loss function, and the loss function is only going to calculate content loss, and the content loss it will calculate is between the um, input that it's got from the low res after going through the CNN compared to the activations from the high res. So in other words, has this CNN successfully created a bigger photo that has the same activations as the high res photo does? And so if we pick the right layer for the high res photo, then that ought to mean that we've constructed a new image. Um, what's that, Rachel? There's a question, can we just stick a CNN between any two things and it will learn the relationship? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and this is one of the things I wanted to talk about today, is um, in fact, I think it's at the start of the next paper we're going to look at, is they even kind of talk about this. Um, so this is the paper we're going to look at today, um, Perceptual Losses for Real-Time Style Transfer and Super Resolutions. This is from 2016, so it took like about a year or so to go from the thing we just saw to this next stage. Uh, is that right? Uh, oh, maybe half a year. Okay. Um, so what they point out in the abstract here is that people had done super resolution with CNNs before, but previously the loss function they used was simply the mean squared error between the pixel outputs of the upscaling network and the actual high res image. Um, and the problem is that it turns out that that tends to create blurry images. And it tends to create blurry images because the, um, the, the CNN has no reason not to create blurry images. Um, and blurry images are actually tend to look pretty good in the loss function, because as long as you get the general, you know, oh, this is probably somebody's face, I'll put like a face color here, right? then it's going to be fine. Whereas if you take the second or third conf block of VGG, then it needs to know that this is an eyeball, or it's not going to look good, right? It needs to know that this is a nose, or it's not going to look good. So if you do it not with pixel loss, but with the content loss we just learned about, um, you're probably going to get better results. So this, um, uh, like many papers in deep learning, uh, this paper introduces its own uh, language, and in the language of this paper, perceptual loss is what they call um, the mean squared errors between the activations of um, uh, a network with two images. So the thing we've been calling content loss, they call perceptual loss. Um, 
So one of the nice things they do at the start of this, um, and I really like it when papers do this, is to say, okay, why is this paper important? Well, this paper is important because many problems can be framed as image transformation tasks, where a system receives some input and chucks out some other output. For example, denoising. Learn to take an input image that's full of noise and spit out a beautifully clean image. Super resolution. Take an input image which is low res and spit out a high res. Colorization. Take an input image which is black and white and spit out something which is color. Now, one of the interesting things here is that all of these examples, you can generate as much input data as you like by taking lots of images which are either from your camera or that you download off the internet or from ImageNet, and you can make them lower res. You can add noise. You can make them black and white. Right? So you can generate as much label data as you like. And that's one of the really cool things about this whole topic of, um, of, of generators. Right, George, just to your left. Glad I didn't have to catch something. Um, well, with that example, so going to lower res imagery or some camera, it's, it's algorithmically done. So is the neural net only going to learn how to like transform out something that's algorithmically done versus an actual low res imagery that doesn't have like? Yeah. So uh, one thing I just mentioned is the way you would create your label data is not to do that low res on the camera. You would grab the images that you've already taken and make them low res just by doing um, uh, filtering, you know, in OpenCV or whatever. Um, and yeah, that is uh, algorithmic, um, and it may not be it may not be perfect. But there's lots of ways of generating that low res image. You know, you can add yeah. So there's lots of ways of creating a low res image. So part of it is about how do you do that creation of the low res image, and how well do you match the real low res data you're going to be getting. Um, but in the end, in this case, um, things like low resolution images or black and white images. It's so hard to start with something which is like, it could be like, an, I've seen versions with just an 8x8 picture and turning it into a, a photo. Like, it's so hard to do that regardless of how that 8x8 thing was created that often the details of how the low res image was created don't really matter too much. Um, there are some uh, other examples they mention which is turning an image into an image, which includes um, segmentation. Uh, we'll learn more about this um, in coming lessons, but segmentation refers to taking a photo of something and creating a new image that basically has a different color for each object. So horses are green, cars are blue, buildings are red, um, that kind of thing. So that's called segmentation. Um, as you know from things like the fisheries competition, segmentation can be really important as a part of solving other bigger problems. Um, Another example they mention here is depth estimation. There's lots of important reasons you would want to use depth estimation. For example, um, maybe you want to create some fancy video effects where you start with um, a flat photo and you want to create some cool new um, uh, Apple TV thing that like moves around the photo with a parallax effect, you know, as if it was 3D. So if you were able to use a CNN to figure out how far away every object was automatically, and you could like turn a 2D photo into a 3D image automatically. Um, so yeah, um, taking uh, an image in and sticking an image out is kind of the idea uh, in computer vision at least of generative networks or generative models. And so this is why I wanted to talk a lot about generative models during this class. Um, it's not just about artistic style. Artistic style was just my sneaky way of introducing you to the world of generative models. Okay, so let's look at how to create this um, super resolution idea. And your homework, or part of your homework this week, will be to create the new approach to style transfer. Okay, so I'm going to build the super resolution version, which is a slightly simpler version, and then you're going to try and build on top of that to create the style transfer version. Okay, so make sure you let me know if you're not sure at any point. So I've already created um, a, a folder of 20,000, um, a sample of 20,000 ImageNet images. 
um, and uh, I've created two sizes. One is 288 by 288, and one is 72 by 72, and um, they're available as B-Coles arrays. Um, um, okay, so uh, I actually posted the link to these last week, and it's uh, on platform.fast.ai. Uh, so we'll open up those B calls arrays, uh, and one trick you might have hopefully learned in part one is that you can turn a B calls array into a NumPy array by slicing it with everything. Right? So anytime you slice the B calls array, you get back a NumPy array. So if your slice is everything, um, then this turns it into a NumPy array. This is just a convenient way of sharing NumPy arrays in this case. So we've now got an array of low resolution images and an array of high resolution images. So um, let me start, start maybe by showing you the final network. Okay, this is the final network. So we start on off by taking in um, a batch of images, uh, low res images. Um, and the very first thing we do is stick them through a convolutional block with a stride of one. Okay, so this is not going to change its size at all. But this convolutional block has a filter size of nine, and it generates 64 filters. So this is a very large filter size, particularly nowadays, filter sizes tend to be three. Um, actually in a lot of modern networks, the very first layer is very often a large filter size, just the one, just one very first layer. And the reason is that it basically allows us to immediately increase the receptive field of all of the um, layers from now on. Right? So by having 9x9, nine nine, um, and we don't lose any information because we've gone from three channels to 64 filters. Right? So each of these 9x9 nine nine convolutions can actually have quite a lot of information because you've got 64 filters. So you'll be seeing this quite a lot in, in modern CNN architectures, just a single large filter conf layer. So this won't be unusual um, in the future. Now the next thing, um, do you want to uh, give the green box behind you? Oh, just a moment, sorry. Yep. The stride one also uh, pretty popular these days? Yeah, well the stride one is important for this first layer because you don't want to throw away any information yet. Right? So in the very first layer, we want to keep the full image size. So with a stride one, it doesn't change, it doesn't downsample at all. But there's also a lot of duplication, right? Like nine filter size and one. Yeah, they, they, they overlap they a lot, lot. absolutely. Um, but that's okay. A, um, a, a good uh, implementation of a convolution is going to hopefully memoize some of that, um, or, or at least keep it in cache, so it hopefully won't slow it down too much. One of the uh, discussions I was just having um, during the break was like um, how how practical you know are the things that we're learning at the moment compared to like part one where everything was just designed entirely to be like here are the most practical things which we have best practices for um, and the answer is like a lot of the stuff we're going to be learning no one quite knows how practical it is because a lot of it's just hasn't really been around that long, and isn't really that well understood, and maybe there aren't really great libraries for it yet. So one of the things I'm actually hoping from this part two is by learning um, the edge of research stuff or beyond um, amongst a diverse group, is that some of you will look at it and think about your whatever you do nine to five or eight to six or whatever, and think, oh, I wonder if I could use that for this. Right? If that ever pops into your head, please tell us, right? Please talk about it on the forum, because that's that's what we're most interested in. It's like, oh, you could use super resolution for blah, or depth finding for this, or generative models in general for this thing you know I do in pathology, or architecture, or satellite engineering, or whatever. Um, so yeah, so it's going to require some imagination sometimes on your part. And so often that's why I do want to spend some time looking at stuff like this, where it's like, okay, what are the kinds of things 
that this can be done for. But one of the, you know, I'm sure you know in your own field, like one of the differences between an expert and beginner is the way an expert can look at something from first principles and say, okay, I could use that for this totally different thing which has got nothing to do with the example that was originally given to me because I know that the basic steps are the same, right? And that's what I'm hoping you guys will, will be able to do is kind of not just say, um, oh, this is running out of batteries again. Let me just plug this in. Um, yeah, it's not just say, okay, now I know how to do artistic style, but, you know, are there things in your field which have some similarities to, um, to artistic style? So we were going to talk about um, the super resolution um, network. And uh, we talked about the idea of uh, the uh, initial conf block. Um, so after the initial conf block, uh, we have the computation. Now when I say the computation, in any kind of generative network, there's like the, act the, the key work it has to do, which in this case is starting with a low-res image, figure out like, what might that black dot be? Is it is it an eyeball, or is it like, is it a wheel? Um, like, it, basically, if you want to do really good upscaling, you actually have to figure out what the objects are so that you know what to draw, right? So that's kind of like the key computation this CNN is going to have to learn to do. In generative models, we generally like to do that computation at a low resolution. And there's a couple of reasons why. The first is, that at a low resolution there's less work to do, so the computation is faster. But more importantly, at higher resolutions, where gen it generally means we have a smaller receptive field, um, it generally means we have less uh, ability to kind of capture large amounts of the image at once. And if you want to do really, um, really great uh, kind of computations where you recognize that, oh, this, this blob here is a face, and therefore the dot inside it is an eyeball, then you're going to need enough of a receptive field to cover that whole area. Right? Now, I noticed a couple of you asked for information about receptive fields um, on, on the forum thread, so um, there's quite a lot of information about this online, so Google is, is your friend here, but the basic idea is if you have a single convolutional filter of 3x3, three three, the receptive field is 3x3. Three three. Um, so it's how much space can that convolutional filter impact? Um, okay, so here's our 3x3 three three filter. Now on the other hand, what if you had a 3x3 three three filter which had a 3x3 three three filter as its input, right? So that means that the center one took all of this, right? But what did this one take? Well, this one would have taken, depending on the stride, probably these ones here, right? And this one over here would have taken these ones here. So in other words, in the second layer, um, assuming a stride of 1, the receptive field is now 5 by 5, not 3 by 3, right? So the receptive field depends on two things. One is how many layers deep are you? And the second is how much uh, did the previous layers either have a um, non-unit stride or maybe they had max pooling. Right? So in some way they were becoming downsampled. And those two things increase the receptive field. And so the reason it's great to be doing um, layer computations on a large receptive field is that it then allows you to you know, look at the big picture. And look at the context. It's not just edges anymore, but, but eyeballs and, and noses. So in this case, we have um, four blocks of computation, where each block is a ResNet block. So for those of you that um, don't recall um, how ResNet works, it would be a good idea to go back to part one and review. Um, but to remind ourselves, let's look at the code. Um, here's a ResNet block. So all a ResNet block does is it takes some input and it does two convolutional blocks on that input and then it adds the result of those convolutions back to the original input. 
So you might remember from part one, we actually kind of drew it. We said there's some input, and it goes through two convolutional blocks, and then it goes back and is added to the original. Right? And if you remember, we basically said in that case, we've got y equals x plus some function of x, right? which means that the function equals y minus x, and this thing here is a residual. Right? So a whole stack of residual blocks, ResNet blocks, on top of each other can learn to gradually get hone in on whatever it's, whatever it's trying to do. In this case, what it's trying to do is get the information it's going to need to upscale this in a smart way. So um, we're going to be using uh, a lot more of this idea of kind of taking blocks that we know work well for something and just reusing them. Right? And so then, uh, what, what's a conv block? Well, all a conv block is in this case is it's a convolution followed by a batch norm, optionally followed by an activation. And one of the things we um, now know about um, ResNet blocks is that we generally don't want um, um, an activation at the end. Um, that's one of the things that a more recent paper um, discovered. So you can see that for my second conv block I have no activation. I'm sure you've noticed throughout this course that I refactor my network architectures a lot. Right? My network architectures don't generally list every single layer, but they're generally functions which have a bunch of functions which have a bunch of layers in. Um, a lot of people don't do this. Like a lot of the net, uh, architectures you find online are like hundreds of lines of layer definitions. I think that's crazy. It's so easy to make mistakes when you do it that way, and so hard to really see what's going on. So, you know, in, in general, I would strongly recommend that you try to refactor your architectures so that by the time you write the final thing, it's you know half a page. Um, and you'll see plenty of examples of that, so hopefully that'll, that'll be helpful. All right, so we've um, increased the receptive field, we've done a bunch of computation, but we still haven't actually changed the size of the image, which is not very helpful. So the next thing we do is we're going to change the size of the image. And the first thing we're going to learn is to do that with something that um, goes by many names. Um, one is deconvolution, another is um, it's also known as transposed convolutions, and it's also known as fractionally strided. Convolutions. Um, in Keras, they call them um, deconvolutions. Um, and the basic idea um, is something which I've actually got a spreadsheet to show you. Okay, so here's a, spread uh, here's a spreadsheet. Um, the basic idea is that you've got some kind of image. So here's a 4x4 four four image, some 4x4 four four data, right? And you put it through. A three by three filter, a convolutional filter, and if you're doing um, valid convolutions, then that's going to leave you with a two by two output, because here's one three by three, another three by three, right? So you've got four of them, and so each one is grabbing the whole filter and the appropriate part of the data. Right? So it's just a standard two D convolution. Right? So we've We've done that. Now let's say we want to undo that, right? We want something which can take this result and recreate this input, right? How would you do that? So one way to do that would be to take this result, right? So let's copy it over here, right? And put back um, that uh, implicit padding. So let's surround it with all these zeros, such that now if we use um, Um, let's have some filter. We'll just start it at zero, right? We have some uh, convolutional filter, right? Um, and we're going to put it through this entire um, matrix, um, a bunch of zeros with our result matrix in the middle, right? And then we can calculate our result in exactly the same way, just a normal convolutional filter. So if we now use gradient descent, 
we can look and see, okay, what is the error, right? So how much does this pixel differ from this pixel, right? And how much does this pixel differ from this pixel? And then we add them all together to get our mean squared error. So we can now use gradient descent, which hopefully you remember from part one in Excel, it's called Solver. And we can say, okay, um, set this cell to a minimum by changing these cells. Right? So this is basically like the simplest possible optimization. Solve that, and here's what it's come up with. Right, so it's come up with um, a convolutional filter. Um, you'll see that the result is not exactly the same as the original data, and of course, how could it be? Right? We don't have enough information. We only have four things to try and regenerate 16 things. But it's not terrible. Right? And in general, this is this is the challenge with upscaling, right? When you've got something that's blurred and downsampled, you've thrown away information. Right? So the only way you can get information back is to guess what was there. But the important thing is that by using a convolution like this, we can learn those filters. So we can learn how to upsample it in a way that gives us the loss that we want. So this is what a deconvolution is. It's just a convolution on a padded input. Right? Now, in this case, I've assumed that my convolutions had a unit stride. Right? There was just one pixel between each convolution. If your um, convolutions are of stride 2, then it looks like this picture. Right? And so you can see that as well as putting the two pixels around the outside, we've also put a zero pixel um, in the middle. Right? So these four cells is now our data cells, and you can then see it calculating a convolution through here. Um, I strongly suggest um, looking at this uh, link, which is where this picture comes from. Um, and in turn, um, this link comes from a fantastic paper uh, called the Convolution Arithmetic Guide. Um, which is a really great paper. And so if you want to know more about both convolutions and deconvolutions, you can look at this uh, page, and it's got lots of beautiful animations, um, including animations on, they call it transposed convolutions. Uh, so you can see... Uh, there we go. This is the one I just showed you, right? So that's the one we just saw in Excel. Um, so that's a good, uh, really great site. Okay, so that's what we're going to do first, um, is we're going to um, do deconvolutions. So in Keras, a deconvolution is exactly the same as convolution, except with DE on the front, but all the same stuff. How many filters do you want? What's the size of your filter? Um, what's your stride? Or Subsample, as they call it, um, border mode, so forth. We have a question: If TensorFlow is the back end, shouldn't the batch normalization axis equals negative one? And then there was a link to um, a. GitHub conversation where Francois yeah. said that for Theano, Axis yeah. is 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it should be. And in fact, um, Axis minus 1 is the default. So, yes. Thank you. Well spotted. Thank David Gutman. Thank you, David Gutman. He is also responsible for some of our beautiful pictures we saw earlier. So, double thank you, David Gutman. Um, so, let's remove Axis. that will make sure things look a bit better, and go faster as well. Um, so just in case you weren't clear on that, you might remember from part one that the reason we had that axis equals one is because in Theano that was the channel axis, right? So we basically wanted not to throw away the x, y information that batch normal across channels. Um, in Theano, um, channel is now the last axis, and since uh, minus one is the default, we actually don't need that. Um, okay, so um, that's our deconvolution blocks, and so we're using a, um, 
a stride of 2 comma 2 Right, so that means that each time we go through this deconvolution, it's going to be doubling the size of the image. For some reason I don't fully understand and haven't really looked into, in Keras you actually have to tell it the shape of the output. Um, so you can see here, I've actually sh you can actually see it's gone from 72 by 72 to 144 by 144 to 288 by 288. Right? So because these are convolutional filters, it's learning to upscale, right? but it's not upscaling with just three channels, it's upscaling with 64 filters. So that's how come it's able to do more sophisticated stuff. Um, and then finally, um, we we're kind of reversing things here. We have another three by th um, another nine by nine convolution um, in order to get back our three channels. Right? So the idea is we previously had something with 64 channels. Um, and so we now want to turn it into something with just three channels, the three colors. And to do that, we want to use quite a bit of context. Right? So we have a 9 by 9 single 9 by 9 filter at the end to get our three channels out. So at the end, we have a 288 by 288 by 3 tensor. In other words, an image. So if we go ahead now and train this, um, then it's going to do basically what we want. But the thing we're going to have to do is to create our loss function. Right? And creating our loss function. Um, is um, a little bit messy, um, but uh, I'll take you through it slowly and hopefully it'll all make sense. Um, so we've taken, just to just remember some of the um, symbols here. Input, imp, is the original low resolution input tensor. And then the output of this is called out p, output. And so let's call this whole network here. Let's call it the upsampling network. Right? So this is the thing that's actually responsible for doing the upsampling. So we're going to take the upsampling network and we're going to attach it to VGG. And the v but VGG is going to be used only as a loss function right? to get the content loss. So before we can take this output and stick it into VGG, we need to stick it through our standard um, mean subtraction preprocessing. So this is just the same thing that we did over and over again in part one. Um, so let's now define an, uh, uh, this output as being um, this lambda function applied to the output of our upsampling um, network. Okay, so that's what this is. This is just our pre-processed upsampling network output. Um, so we can now create a VGG network, and let's go through every layer and make it not trainable, right? Like you can't ever make your loss function be trainable. Like the loss function is the fixed in stone thing that tells you how well you're doing. So clearly, you have to make sure VGG is not trainable. All right, now which bit of um, the VGG network do we want? We well, can try a few things. Um, I'm using block two conv two. Okay, so relatively early, and the reason for that is that if you remember when we did the um, content reconstruction last week, the very first thing we did, we found that if you, you could basically totally reconstruct the original image from early layer activations, whereas by the time we got to layer four, uh, sorry, block four, we got pretty horrendous things. Right? So we're going to use a somewhat early um, block uh, as our Content loss, or as the paper calls it, uh, the perceptual loss. Right? And you can play around with this, uh, see how it goes. All right, so now we're going to create two versions of this um, VGG output. And this is something which is, uh, I think, very poorly understood or appreciated with the um, Keras's functional API, which is any kind of layer. And a model is a layer, as far as Keras is concerned, can be treated as if it was a function. Right? So we can take this model and pretend it's a function. And we can pass it any tensor we like. And what that does is it creates a new model where those two pieces are joined together. Right? So VGG2 is now equal to this model on the top. And this model on the bottom. And remember, this model was the result of our 
upsampling network followed by pre-processing. And, and the upsampling network, um, is the lambda function to normalize the output image? Yeah, um, that's a good point. So um, we use a fan activation which uh, can go from negative one to one. Uh, so if you then go that plus one times 127 and a half, that gives you something that's between naught and 255. Um, which is the range that we want. Um, interestingly, this was suggested in the original paper and supplementary materials. Um, more recently, in, um, on Reddit, I think it was, the author said that they tried it without the THAN activation and therefore without the um, final um, deprocessing, and it worked just as well. So you can try doing that. If you wanted to try it, you would just remove the activation and you would just remove this last thing entirely. But obviously, if you do have a THAN, then you need the um, output. And this is actually something I've been playing with with a lot of different um, models. Anytime I have some particular range that I want, um, one way to enforce that is by having a THAN or sigmoid followed by something that turns that into the range you want. Um, it's not just for images. Um, okay. So we've got two versions of our VGG um, layer output. One, which is based on the output of the um, upscaling network, and the other, which is based on just an input. Right? And this just an input is using the high-resolution shape as its input. Right? So that makes sense, because this VGG network is something that we're going to be using at the high resolution scale, we're going to be taking the high resolution um, target image and the high resolution upsampling result and comparing them. Okay? So now that we've done all that, we're nearly there. Um, we've now got um, the uh, high res um, perceptual activations uh, and we've got the low res upsampled perceptual activations. We now just need to take the mean sum of squares between them. And here it is here. In Keras, uh, anytime you put something into a network, it has to be a layer. Um, so if you want to take a, just a plain old function and turn it into a layer, you just chuck it inside a lambda, a capital L lambda. Um, so that's all that's for. So our final model is going to take our upsampled input and our, uh, sorry, our low res input and our high res input as our two inputs. And return this loss function as an output. Okay, one last trick. Um, when you fit things in Keras, it assumes that you're trying to take some output and make it close to some target. In this case, our loss is the actual loss function we want. It's not that there's some target, right? We want to make it as low as possible. Um, since it's a sum of squared errors, um, or mean squared error actually, um, it can't go beneath zero, so what we can do is we can basically trick Keras and say that our target for the loss is zero. And you can't just use the scalar zero, remember every time we have a, a target set of labels in Keras, you need one for every row, right? You need one for every input. So we're going to create an array of zeros. Okay? So that's, that's just so that we can fit it into what Keras expects. And I kind of find that increasingly as I start to move away from the kind of, um, you know, the well-trodden path of deep learning, more and more, you, you know, particularly if you want to use Keras, you kind of have to do weird little hacks like this. Um, so so be it, there's a weird little hack. Um, um, there's probably more elegant ways of doing this, um, but this works. So we've got our loss function that we're trying to get every row as close to zero as possible. We have a question. If we're only using up to block two, conv two, could we pop off all the layers afterwards to save some computation? Sure, sure. That wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Um, okay, so we compile it, uh, we fit it. Um, one thing you'll notice I've started doing is using. Um, find it here. Um, this callback called TQDM Notebook Callback. Um, TQDM is a really terrific library. Um, basically, it does something very, very simple, which is to um, add a, 
as it says here, add a progress meter to your loops. Um, you can use it um, in a, a console, as you can see, and so basically anywhere you've got a loop you can add TQDM around it, right? and that loop does just what it used to do, but it gets its progress back. Um, it even guesses you know, how much time is left and so forth. Um, you can also use it inside a Jupyter Notebook, um, and it creates a neat little um, neat little uh, graph that gradually goes up and shows you how long is left and so forth. So this is just a nice little trick. Um, use some learning rate annealing, um, and at the end of training it for a few epochs, um, we can uh, try out our model. Now the model we're interested in is just the upsampling model, right? We're going to be feeding the upsampling model um, low res inputs and getting out the high res outputs. We don't actually really care about the value of the loss. So I'll now define a model which takes as input the low res input and spits out this output, our high res output. Um, so with that model we can try it, called predict. So here is our original low-resolution mashed potato, and here is a high-resolution mashed potato. And it's, it's amazing what it's done. Like, you can see in the original, like, the shadow of the leaf was very unclear, the kind of the bits in the mashed potato were just kind of vague blobs. Um, in this version we have like clear shadows, hard edges, um, um, and so forth. Question, can you explain the size of the target? It's the first dimension of the high res times 128. Why? Um, it's the, okay, so obviously it's this um, number, so this is the basically the number of images that we have. Uh, and then it's 128. Oh, it's 128 because um, that layer has 128 filters. Uh, so this ends up giving you um, uh, the uh, mean squared error of 128 filter losses. Well, since I did this. Um, yes. And then there was another question, would popping the unused layers really save anything? Aren't you only getting the layers you want um, when you do the bgg.getLayer block2 conf2? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, 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 don't, I, have, I can't quite think quickly enough. Um, you could try it. It, it. it might not help. And intuitively, what features is this model learning? Well, what it's learning is it's looking at 20,000 images, um, very, very, very low resolution images like this, and it's learning like when there's a kind of a soft gray bit next to a hard bit, you know, in certain situations that's probably a shadow, and when there's a shadow this is what a shadow looks like, for example. It's learning that when there's a curve um, it doesn't actually meant to look like a jagged edge, but it's actually meant to look like a, something smooth. Um, you know, it's really learning what the world looks like, you know, and then when you take that world and blur it and make it small, you know, what does it then look like? And so it's just like when you, uh, when you look at a picture like this, and particularly if you like uh, kind of blur your eyes and defocus your eyes, you, you can often see you know, what it originally looked like, because your brain basically is doing the same thing. It's like when you read a really blurry text, you can still read it, because your brain's thinking like it knows, like, oh, that must have been an E, that must have been an F. Um, so are you suggesting there is a similar universality uh, on the other way around? Like, you know when VGG is saying the first layer is learning a line, and then a square, and a nose or eye. Are you saying the same thing is true in this case? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, 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 it has to be. Like, there's no way to upsample. Like, there's an infinite number of ways you can upsample. There's lost information. So in order to do it in a way that 
decreases this loss function, it actually has to figure out, you know, what what's probably there based on its context. But don't you agree? I'm just intuitively thinking about it, like example of the that you say, suggesting like the album of pictures for your mom. Would you think like be a bit easier if we're just feeding it pictures of humans because it's like the interaction of the circle of the eye and the nose yeah. is going to oh, yeah. be a lot better. You, um, and so the, in the most extreme versions of super resolution networks, so they take eight by eight pictures, you'll see that all of them pretty much use the same data set, which is something called Celeb A. Celeb A is a, a data set of pictures of celebrity spaces. And all celebrity spaces look pretty similar. You know, and so they show these fantastic, and they are fantastic and amazing results, but they take an 8x8 eight eight and turn it into a picture of the face, and it looks pretty close, right? And that's because they've taken advantage of this. If you, in our case, we've got 20,000 images from 1,000 categories, um, it's not going to do nearly as well. Um, if we wanted to do as well as the Select A versions, we would need hundreds of millions of images of 1,000 categories. Oh, yeah, right. it's just it's hard for me to imagine mashed potatoes and a face kind of like in the same category. That's my yeah, biggest just, thing the, 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 here. The key thing to realize is there's nothing qualitatively different between what mashed potato looks like and what faces look like. So, you know, something can learn <laughs> to recognize the unique features of mashed potato. Um, and so, and a big enough network and enough examples can learn not just mashed potato, but writing and anger pictures and whatever. So, you know, for your examples, you're most likely to be doing stuff which is more domain-specific, and so you should use more domain-specific data taking advantage of exactly uh, these kinds of issues. That's a good question, thank you. Okay, so, um, Um, one thing I mentioned here is I haven't used a test set, um, so another piece of the homework is to um, add in a test set, right? And 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 tell us um, is this mashed potato overfit, right? Is this actually just matching the particular um, training set version of this mashed potato or not? Uh, and if it is overfitting, can you can you create something that doesn't overfit? Um, so there's another piece of homework. So um, it's very simple now to take this and turn it into our fast style transfer. So the fast style transfer is going to do exactly the same thing, but um, rather than taking something, turning something low res into something high res, um, it's going to take something um, that's a photo and turn it into um, Van Gogh's irises. Um, so. We're going to do that in just the same way. We're going to, rather than go from um, low res through a CNN to find the content loss against high res, um, we're going to take um, a photo, go through a CNN, and do both style loss and content loss against a single fixed style image. Um, I've got, given you links here, so I have not implemented this for you. This is for you to implement. Um, but I have given you links to the original paper, and very importantly also to the supplementary material, which is a little hard to find because there's two different versions, and only one of them is correct. Uh, and of course they don't tell you which one is correct. Um, so the supplementary material uh, goes through all of the exact details of, of what was their loss function, what was their processing, what was their exact architecture, um, and so on and so forth. So while I wait for that to load, uh, I got a question. Yeah. Um, like we did a doodle regeneration using the models photographers' weights. Um, could we create a regular image to see how you would look if you were a model? I don't know. I'm not exactly like if you could come up with a loss function, which is how much does somebody look like a model? You could. So you'd have to come up with a loss function, um, and and it'd have to be something where you can generate labeled data. One of the things they mention in the paper is that um, they found it very important to um, add quite a lot of padding 
And specifically, they didn't add zero padding, you know, normally we just add a black border, but they add reflection padding. So reflection padding literally means take the edge and reflect it to your padding. Um, I've written that for you, because there isn't one, um, but you may find it interesting to look at this, because this is like one of the simplest examples of a custom layer. Right? So um, we're going to be using custom layers more and more, and so I don't want you to be afraid of them. So a custom layer in Keras is a Python class, so if you haven't done, as I mentioned before the class started, if you haven't done OO programming in Python, now's a good time to go and look at some tutorials, because we're going to be doing quite a lot of it, particularly for PyTorch. PyTorch absolutely relies on it. So we're going to create a class, it has to inherit from layer, and Python, this is how you can create a constructor. Python's OO syntax is really gross. Um, you have to use this special weird custom name thing, which happens to be the constructor. Every single damn thing inside a class, you have to manually type out self comma as the first parameter, and if you forget, you'll get stupid errors. I'm sorry, it's not my fault. Um, and then in the constructor for a layer, this is basically where you just save away any of the information you were given. So in this case, you need, you've said that I want this much padding, so you just have to save that somewhere and say I need this much padding. Um, and then you need to do two things uh, in every Keras custom layer. One is you have to define something called get output shape for. That is going to pass in the shape of an input, and you have to return what is the shape of the output that that would create. So in this case, if S is the shape of the input, then the output is going to be the same batch size and the same number of channels, and then we're going to add in twice the amount of padding to both the rows and columns. So this is going to tell it, because remember one of the cool things about Keras is like you just chuck the layers on top of each other, and it magically knows how big all the intermediate things are. It magically knows because every layer has this thing defined. That's how it works. Right? The second thing you have to define is something called call. And call is the thing which will get your layer data, and you have to return whatever your layer does. Right? And in our case, we want to uh, cause, cause it to add reflection padding, and uh, in this case, um, it so happens that TensorFlow has something built in for that called tf.pad. Um, obviously, generally it's nice to create um, Keras layers that would work with both Theano and TensorFlow backends, by using that capital K dot notation, but in this case Theano didn't have anything obvious that did this easily, and since it was just for our class, I just decided just to make it TensorFlow only. Okay? Um, so here is a complete uh, layer. Um, I can now use that layer in a network definition like this. Uh, I can call dot .predict, uh, which will take an input uh, and turn it into, you can see that the bird now has the left and right sides here have been reflected. Okay, So um, that is there for you to use, because uh, in the supplementary material for the paper, they add that they add spatial reflection padding to the beginning of the network, and they add a lot, 40 by 40. And the reason they add a lot is because they mention in the supplementary material that they don't want to use um, um, same convolutions, they want to use valid convolutions in their computation, because if you add any black borders during those computation steps, it creates weird artifacts on the edges of the images. So you'll see that through this computation of all their residual blocks, the size gets smaller by 4 each time, and that's because these are valid convolutions. So that's why they have to add um, padding to the start, um, so that these steps don't uh, cause the image to become too small. So this section here should look very familiar, because it's the same as our app sampling network. A bunch of residual blocks, two deconvolutions, and one 9x9 nine nine convolution. Right? So this is identical, so you can copy it. Um, <coughs> This is the new bit, right? and so why do we have, we've already talked about why we have this 9x9 conf, but why do we have these 
downsampling convolutions to start with. We start with an image up here of 336 by 336, and we halve its size, and then we halve its size again. Why do we do that? Um, like The reason we do that um, is that, as I mentioned earlier, we want to do our computation um, at a lower resolution, because it allows us to have a larger receptive field, and it allows us to do less computation. So this, um, this pattern where it's like reflective, right? Like the last thing is the same as the, set, the top thing, the second last thing is the same as the second thing. You can see it's like a reflection, symmetric. Uh, it's really, really common in generative models. It's first of all to take your object, downsample it, increasing the number of channels at the same time, so you're increasing the receptive field, you're creating more and more complex representations, you then do a bunch of computation on those representations, and then at the end you upsample it again. So you're going to see this pattern all the time. And so that's why I wanted you guys to um, implement this yourself this week. Okay? So there's that. Right? That's the last major piece of your homework. Yes, sir. There are questions about uh, what does stride equals one half mean? Um, that's um, exactly the same as deconvolution stride two. So remember I mentioned earlier that um, another name for deconvolution is fractionally strided convolution. Uh, so you can remember that little picture we saw this idea of like you put little columns and rows of zeros in between each row and column. So that's you can kind of think of it as doing like a half stride at a time. Um, so that's why, yeah, this is exactly what we already have. Um, you, I don't think you need to change it at all. Oh, except you'll need to change my um, same convolutions to valid convolutions. Um, but this is well worth reading the whole supplementary material because it really has the details. And it's it's so great when a paper has supplementary material like this. You'll often find, in fact, the majority of papers don't actually tell you. The details of how to do what they did, um, and many don't even have code. Uh, these guys both have code and supplementary material, which makes this an absolute A plus paper. Um, plus, it works great. Um, okay, so that is super resolution, perceptual losses, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I am glad we got there, because now I can start on that bit. Uh, let's make sure I don't have any more slides. Oh, there was one other thing I was going to show you, um, which is um, these deconvolutions um, can create some um, very ugly artifacts, and I can show you some very ugly artifacts because I have some right here. You see these? You see it on the screen, Rachel? This checkerboard. Okay, this is called a checkerboard pattern. Right. Um, the, the checkerboard pattern um, happens for a very specific reason, um, and I've provided a link to this paper. Oh, well, not really, well, I guess it is a paper. It's an online paper. Um, you guys uh, might remember Chris Ola. He had a lot of the best uh, kind of um, learning materials we looked at in part one. He's now got this cool thing called distill.pub, done with some of his colleagues at uh, Google. Um, and uh, he wrote this thing discovering why is it that everybody gets these goddamn checkerboard patterns, right? And what he shows is that it happens because you have stride 2, size 3 convolutions, which means that every pair of convolutions sees one pixel twice, right? So it's like a checkerboard is just a natural thing that's going to come out. Um, so they talk about you know this in some detail and all the kind of things you can do, um, but in the end um, they point out uh, two things. The first is um, that you can avoid this by making it that your um, your stride uh, divides nicely into your size. So if I change size to four, they've gone. Right. So one thing you could try. If you're getting checkerboard patterns, which you will, is make your 
size 3 convolutions into size 4 convolutions. The second thing that he suggests doing is not to use deconvolutions. Instead of using a deconvolution, he suggests first of all doing an upsampling. Um, what happens when you do an upsampling is it's the, uh, basically the opposite of max pooling. You take every pixel and you turn it into a 2x2 two two grid of that exact pixel. Right? That's called upsampling. Um, if you do an upsampling followed by a regular convolution, that also gets rid of the checkerboard pattern. And as it happens, uh, Keras has um, something to do that, which is called um, I guess it's not loaded yet. It's called upsampling 2D. Um, so all this does is kind of the opposite of max pooling. It's going to double the size of your image, at which point you can use a standard normal uh, unit strata convolution um, and avoid the artifacts. So extra credit uh, after you get your network working is to change it to an upsampling and unit stride convolution network um, uh, and see if the um, checkerboard artifacts go away. Okay, so that is that. Um, at the very end here I've got some suggestions for some more things that you can look at, um, although most of those were already in the PowerPoint, so I um, don't think there's anything else there. Okay, so let's move on. Um, Uh, I want to talk about um, going big. Uh, going big uh, can mean two things. Of course, it does mean we get to say big data, um, which is important. You have to do that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very proud that even during the big data thing, I never said big data without saying rude things about the stupid idea of big data. So. Um, who cares about how big it is? But in deep learning, you know, sometimes we do need to use uh, either um, large objects, like if you're doing diabetic retinopathy, you will have like 4,000 by 4,000 pictures of eyeballs, or maybe you've got lots of images, uh, lots of uh, lots of objects, um, like if you're working with ImageNet. And to handle this uh, uh, data that doesn't fit in RAM, um, we need some tricks. So I thought we would try some interesting project that uh, involves looking at the whole um, ImageNet competition data set. So the ImageNet competition data set is uh, it's about, uh, one and a half million images in a thousand categories. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I think in the last class, um, if you try to download it, um, it will give you a little form saying you have to use it for research purposes and that they're going to check it and blah blah blah. In practice, if you fill out the form, you'll get back an answer seconds later. So anybody who's got a terabyte of space, um, and since you're building your own boxes, you now have a terabyte of space, um, you can go ahead and download ImageNet. Um, and then you can start working through this project. So this project is um, about um, implementing a paper called um, Devise. And Devise is a really, really interesting paper. Um, I actually just um, chatted to the author about it quite recently. Um, uh, Amazing lady named uh, Andrea Frome, who's now at uh, Clarify, um, which is a computer vision startup. And what she did was devise was she created a really interesting multimodal architecture. So multimodal means that we're going to be combining different types of object. And in her case, she was combining um, language with images. Now it's quite an early paper to look at this idea. And she did something which was really interesting. She said, normally when we do an image net network, our um, final layer is a one-hot encoding of a category. And so that means that a pug and a golden retriever are no more similar or different in terms of that encoding than a pug and a jumbo, jumbo jet. And that seems kind of weird, right? Like, if you had an encoding where similar things were similar in the encoding, you could do some pretty cool stuff. And in particular, what she was trying to do, one of the key things she was trying to do, is to create something which went beyond the thousand image net categories, so that you could uh, work with types of images that were not in image net at all. And so the way she did that was to say, all right, 
let's throw away the one hot encoder category and let's replace it with a word embedding of the thing. Right? So pug is now no longer 0001000000, but it's now the word to vec vector for pug. And that's it. That's the entirety of the thing. Train that and see what happens. Uh, I'll provide a link to the paper, and one of the things I love about the paper is that um, what she does is to show quite an interesting range of the kinds of cool results and cool things you can do when you replace a one-hot encoded output with a vector output uh, embedding. Uh, just to clarify, so every pixel, uh, one-hot encoded pixel, suddenly becomes a vector with like... No, pi no, pixels are not one hot encoded, yeah. ever. Pixels are um, encoded by their channel. So, sorry, I mean bit bit of uh, one hot encoded um, results, right? No, so no? The, the, um, the, let's take, uh, let's say this is an image of a, a pug, right? It's a type of dog, and so pug gets turned into, you know, let's say pug is the 300th um, uh, uh, class in ImageNet, um, it's going to get turned into a 1,000 long vector with a thousand zeros, uh, sorry, 999 zeros and a one in position 300. That's normally what we use as our as our target when we're doing image classification. We're going to throw that uh, 1,000 long thing away and replace it with a 300 long thing, and the 300 long thing will be the um, the word vector for pug. That we downloaded from word to vec. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so normally we have um, our input image comes in. It goes through some kind of computation in our CNN, and it has to predict something. And normally the thing it has to predict is a whole bunch of zeros. And a one here, and so the way we do that is that the last layer is a softmax layer, which encourages one of the things to be much higher than the others. So all we do is we throw that away, and we replace it with the word vector for that for that thing, box or park or jumbo jet. And since the word vector, so generally that might be say 300 dimensions, um, and that's um, that's dense. That's not lots of zeros, so we can't use a softmax layer at the end anymore. We probably now just use a regular linear layer. Um, okay. So the hard part about doing this really is um, processing image now, not. You know, there's nothing weird or interesting or tricky about the architecture. Right? All we do is replace the last layer. Um, so we're going to leverage um, big holes quite a lot. Um, so we start off by importing our usual stuff, and don't forget with TensorFlow to call this limit mem thing I created so that you don't use up all of your memory. Um, and one thing which can be very helpful is to define actually two parts. Um, once you've got your own box, you've got um, a bunch of spinning hard disks that are big and slow and cheap, and maybe a couple of fast, expensive, small SSDs or NVMe drives. So I generally think it's a good idea to define a path to both, right? One to, um, this actually happens to be a mount point that has my big, slow, ex uh, cheap spinning disks, and this path happens to live uh, somewhere, which is my fast SSDs. And that way, throughout my, when I'm doing my um, code, any time I've got something I'm going to be accessing a lot, particularly if it's in a random order, I'm going to want to make sure that that thing, as long as it's not too big, sits in this path, and any time I'm um, accessing something which I'm accessing generally sequentially, or which is really big, I can put it in this path. This is one of the good reasons, another good reason to have your own box, is that you get this kind of flexibility. Okay, so the first thing we need is some word vectors. Um, so interestingly, um, actually, the the paper 
built their own um, Wikipedia word vectors. Um, I actually think that the word to vec vectors you can download from Google are a really maybe a better choice here. Um, so I've just gone ahead and shown how you can load them in. Um, one of the very nice things about Google's word to vec word vectors is that where else? Um, do you remember la uh, last in part one when we used word vectors, we tended to use glove. Um, Glove um, would not have a word vector for golden retriever. They would have a word vector for golden. Uh, they don't have like phrase things. Whereas Google's word vectors have phrases like golden retriever. So for our thing, we really need to use Google's word to vec vectors. Plus anything like that which has like multi part concepts as things that we can look at. So you can download uh, word to vec um, I will make them available on our um, platform.ai site because um, the only way to get them otherwise is to get them from like this um, the author's Google Drive directory and trying to get to a Google Drive directory from Linux is an absolute nightmare. So I will save them for you so that you don't have the headache. Um, so uh, once you've got them you can load them in. Um, and then I they're in a weird proprietary binary. It's like oh, it's like if you're going to share data, why put it in a weird proprietary binary format in a Google Drive thing that you can't access from Linux? Anyway, this guy did. Um, so I then save it as text to make it a bit easier to work with. Um, the word vectors themselves are in a very simple format. Um, they're just the word followed by a space followed by the vector um, space separated. Um, I'm going to save them in a um, simple um, uh, dictionary format. So what I'm going to share with you guys will be the dictionary. So it's a dictionary from word or phrase to a NumPy array. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I've used this idea of zip star before, so I should talk about this a little bit. So if I've got a dictionary, a dictionary which maps from word to vector, how do I get out of that a list of the words and a list of the vectors? And the short answer is like this. Um, but let's think about what that's doing. So I don't know, like we've used zip quite a bit, right? So normally with zip, you go like zip, um, list one, comma, list two, comma, whatever, right? And what that returns is an iterator which first of all gives you element 1 of list 1, element 1 of list 2, element 1 of list 3, and then element 2 of list 1, and so forth. That's what zip normally does. There's a nice idea in Python that you can put a star before any argument, and if that argument is um, an iterator, something that you can loop through, it acts as if you had taken that whole list and actually put it inside those brackets, right? So let's say that w to v list contained like fox colon and then some array and then pug colon and then some array and so forth, right? When you go zip star that, it's the same as actually taking the contents of that list and putting them inside there. You would want star star if it was a dictionary star for list. Um, not quite. Um, star just means you're treating it as an iterator. Um, um, but you're right. I mean, in this case, we are using a list, so let's let's not let's not worry about it. So yeah, you can use. Let's talk about star star another time. Um, but you're right, in this case we have a list which is actually just in this format. It's fox, comma, array, pug, comma, array, and then lots more. Right? So um, what this is going to do is when we zip this, is it's going to basically take all of these things and create one list for those, so that's going to become words. And then all of these things, we'll create one list for those, and that's going to become vectors. 
So this idea of um, zip star is something we're going to use quite a lot. Um, honestly, I don't normally like think about what it's doing. I just know that anytime I've got um, like a list of tuples and I want to turn it into a tuple of lists, you just do zip star. So um, that's all that is. It's just a little Python thing. Okay. So this gives us a list of words and a list of vectors. So anytime I start looking at some new data, um, I always want to test it, and so I wanted to make sure this worked the way I thought it ought to work. So one thing I thought was, okay, let's look at the correlation coefficient between small j Jeremy and big j Jeremy, and indeed there is some correlation, which you would expect, or else the correlation between Jeremy and banana, I hate bananas. So I was hoping this would be like massively negative. Unfortunately, it's not, but it is at least lower than the correlation between Jeremy and Big Jeremy. So, like, okay, it's it's not always easy to exactly test data, but you know, try and come up with things that ought to be true, make sure they are true. Um, and so, in this case, this has given me some comfort that these word vectors behave the way I expect them to. Um, now, I don't really care about capitalization, so I'll just go ahead and create a lowercase word to vec. Dictionary, where I just do the lowercase version for everything. Um, one trick here is I go through in reverse, um, because word to vec is ordered um, where the most common words are first. So by going in reverse, it means if there is both a capital J Jeremy and a small j Jeremy, the one that's going to end up in my dictionary will be the more common one. Okay. So. Um, what I want for devise is to now um, get this word vector for each one of our 1,000 categories um, in ImageNet. And then I'm going to go even further than that, because I want to go beyond ImageNet. So I actually went and downloaded the original WordNet categories, and I filled it down to find all the nouns, and I discovered that there are actually 82,000 nouns in WordNet. Which is quite a few. It's quite fun looking through them. So I'm going to create a map of word vectors for every ImageNet category, that'll be one set, and every WordNet noun, that'll be another set. And so my goal in this project will be to try and create something that can do useful things with the full set of WordNet nouns. We're going to go beyond ImageNet. Um, we've already got the 1000 ImageNet categories, we've used that plenty of times before, so I'll grab those, load them in. Um, I can, um, okay, and then I do the same thing for um, the full set uh, of WordNet IDs, which I will um, share with you. Um, and so now I can go ahead and create um, uh, a dictionary which goes through every one of my, um, every one of my ImageNet thousand categories uh, and converts it into the um, word vector. Um, notice I have a filter here, um, and that's because some of the ImageNet categories um, won't be in um, word to vec and that's because like sometimes the ImageNet categories will say things like hug bracket doc. You know, they won't be exactly in the same format. Um, if you wanted to, you could probably get a better match than this. But I found even with this simple approach, I managed to match 51,600 out of the 82,000 um, WordNet nouns, uh, which I thought was um, pretty good. So what I did then was I created a list of uh, all of the categories which didn't match, and uh, this commented out bit, as you can see, is something which literally just moved those folders out of the way, so that they're not in my ImageNet um, path. Anymore. Okay, so the details aren't very important, but hopefully you can see at the end of this process, I've got something that maps every ImageNet category to a word vector, at least if I can find it, and every WordNet noun to a vector, at least if I can find it, and that I've modified my ImageNet um, uh, data so that the uh, categories I couldn't find, I've moved those folders out of the way. Okay, nothing particularly interesting there, um, and that's because WordNet's not that big. 
fits in RAM. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, the images are a bit harder because we've got you know a million or so images. Um, so we're going to try everything we can to make this run as quickly as possible. Um, so to start with, even um, the very process of getting a list of the file names of everything in ImageNet takes a non-trivial amount of time. So like everything that takes a non-trivial amount of time, we're going to save its output. Right? So the first thing I do is I use um, Glob. glob. I, don't, I can't remember if we used Glob in part one. I think we did. Yeah, it's just a thing that's like ls star dot star, right? That's called a glob. Um, so we use glob to grab um, all of the um, image net trading set, and then I just go ahead and pickle dot dump that list. Um, so I can pickle dot load it later. Um, for various reasons that we'll see shortly, it's actually a very good idea though at this point to randomize that list of file names. Let's put them in a random order. Um, the basic idea is later on. Um, if we use uh, kind of chunks of file names that are next to each other, they're not all going to be the same type of thing, right? So by randomizing the file names now, it's going to save us a bit of time. Um, so then I can go ahead and save that randomized list. I've given it a different name, so I can always come back to the original. So I want to resize all of my images to a constant size. Um, I'm being a bit lazy here. I'm going to resize them to 224 by 224. That's the input size for um, a lot of models, obviously, um, including the one that we're going to use. It would probably be better if we resized to, to something bigger, and then we like randomly zoom and crop. Um, maybe if we have time, we'll we'll try that later. Um, but for now, we're just going to use uh, resize everything to 224 by 224. Okay, so we have uh, nearly a million images, it turns out, to resize to 224 by 224. Um, that could be pretty slow. So I've got some handy tricks to make it much faster. Um, generally speaking, there are three ways to um, make an algorithm significantly faster. Um, the three ways are uh, if just cache. I say memory locality. I'm going to explain these in a moment. Memory locality. Um, the second is um, um, SIMD, also known as vectorization. Um, and the third is parallel processing. So Rachel's very familiar with these because she's currently creating a um, course uh, for the master's students here on numerical linear algebra, which is like very heavily about these things. Um, so these are the three ways you can make um, data processing faster. Memory locality simply means in your computer you have lots of different kinds of memory. Um, you have, for example, level one cache, level two cache, RAM, Solid state disk, regular on hard drives, whatever. Right. Um, the difference in speed as you go up from one to the other is generally like ten times or a hundred times or a thousand times slower. Like you really, really, really don't want to go to the next level of the memory hierarchy if you can avoid it. Unfortunately, level one cache might be more like 16k. Um, level 2 cache might be a few meg, RAM is going to be a few gig, solid state drives is probably going to be a few hundreds of gig, and your hard drives are probably going to be a few terabytes. So in reality, you've got to be careful about how you manage these things. Um, so you want to try and make sure that you're putting stuff in the right place, um, that you're not filling up the resources unnecessarily, um, and that if you use if you're going to use a piece of data multiple times, try to use it each time, like immediately use it again, so that it's already in your cache. Right? The second thing, which is what we're about to look, look at, is SIMD, which stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. 
something that a shockingly large number of people, even who claim to be professional computer programmers, don't know, is that every modern um, CPU is capable of, uh, in a single operation, in a single thread, calculating multiple things at the same time. And the way that it does it is that you basically create a little vector of generally about eight things, right? And you put all the things you want to calculate. So let's say you want to take the square root of something. You put eight things into this little vector, right? Um, and then you call a particular CPU instruction, which is basically a take the uh, square root of eight floating point numbers that is in this register. And it does it in a single clock cycle. So when we say clock cycle, you know your CPU might be, say, two or three gigahertz, right? So it's doing two or three billion things per second. Well, it's not. It's doing two or three billion times eight things per second if you're using SIMD. Because so few people are aware of SIMD, and because a lot of programming environments don't make it easy to use SIMD, a lot of stuff is not written to take advantage of SIMD, including, for example, pretty much all of the image processing in Python. However, you can do this. You can go pip install pillow SIMD, and that will replace your pillow. Remember, pillow is like the main Python imaging library. With a new version that does use SIMD, or at least some of its things. Right? Um, because SIMD only works on certain CPUs, I mean any, any vaguely recent CPU it works, but because it's only some, you have to add some special directives to the compiler to tell it, I want to use, I have this kind of CPU, so please do use these kinds of instructions. Um, and what pillow SAMD does, it actually literally replaces your existing pillow, right? So that's why you have to say force reinstall, because it's going to be like, oh, you already have pillow. So this is like, no, I want pillow SAMD. So if you try this, you'll find that the speed of your resize literally goes up by 600%. You don't have to change any code. Okay. So um, I'm like a huge fan of SAMD in general. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm not particularly fond of Python, because it doesn't make it at all easy to use SIMD. Um, um, but luckily some people have written uh, stuff in C, which does use SIMD, and then provided these Python interfaces. Okay, so this is something to remember to try to get working when you go home. Um, before you do it, write a little benchmark that resizes a thousand images and times it. And then run this command and make sure that it gets 600% faster. That way you know it's, it's actually working. Um, we had two questions. I don't know if you want to finish the three uh, ways to do things faster first. Or... You go. Um, one is, how could you get the relation uh, between a pug and a dog, um, and the photo of a pug and its relation to the bigger category of dog? Um. Yes, I'm not sure. We'll think about that. Okay. Um, another, why do we want to randomize the file names? Can't we use um, shuffle equals true on the Keras flow from directory? You'll see. Yeah. Um, the short answer is kind of to do with locality. Right? If you say shuffle equals true, you're jumping from here on the hard disk to here on the hard disk to here on the hard disk. And hard disks hate that. Like literally, remember, there's a spinning disk with a little needle. Right? And the thing's moving all over the place. So you want to be getting things that are all in a row. That's basically the reason. Um, as you'll see, this was going to basically work for the concept of dog versus pug, because the word vector for dog is very similar to word vector for pug. So at the end, we'll try it. We'll try and we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can find some dogs. We'll see if it works. Uh, I'm sure it will. Uh, finally, there's parallel processing. Um, parallel processing refers to the fact that, hopefully, as you all know, um, any modern uh, CPU has multiple cores, right? which literally means multiple CPUs in your CPU. Um, and often, um, boxes that you buy for home might even have multiple CPUs in them. Um, again, Python's not great for parallel processing. Python 3 is certainly a lot better. Um, but a lot of stuff in Python doesn't use parallel processing very effectively. Um, but 
a lot of modern CPUs have 10 cores or more, even for a you know, consumer CPU. So if you're not using parallel processing, you're missing out on a 10x speedup. If you're not using SAMD, you're missing out on a 6 to 8x speedup. Right? So if you can do both of these things, you can get 50 plus. I mean, you will. You'll get 50 plus speedup, um, assuming your CPU has enough cores. So we're going to do both. Um, to get SAMD, we're just going to install it. Um, to get parallel processing, um, we're probably not going to see all of it today, but we're going to be using parallel processing. Um, so I define um, a few things to do my um, resizing. Um, one thing is um, I've actually recently changed uh, how I do resizing. As I'm sure you guys have noticed, in the past when I've resized things to square, I've tended to act, add, a, add a black border to the bottom or a black border to the right, because um, that's what Kerats did. Um, now that I've looked into it, like no best practice papers, Kaggle results, anything used that way. And it makes perfect sense because a CNN is going to have to like learn to deal with the black border. Um, and you're throwing away all that information. Um, what pretty much all the best practice approach is, is to um, rather than rescale the longest side to be the size of your square and then fill it in with black, instead take the smallest side and make that the size of your square. The other side's now too big, so just chop off the top and bottom, or chop off the right or right and left. That's called center cropping. Right? So resizing and center cropping. So what I've done here is I've got something which resizes to the size of the shortest side, um, and then over here, somewhere, over here I've got something which um, does the center cropping. Um, you can look at the details when you get home if you like, it's not particularly exciting. Um, so I've got something that does the resizing. Um, this is something you can improve. Currently I'm making sure that it's a three-channel image. Um, so I'm not dealing with black and white or something with an alpha channel. Uh, I just ignore them. Um, okay. So before I finish up, there's um, I think I'm out of time. So what we're going to learn uh, next time when we start is we're going to learn about uh, parallel processing. Um, so anybody who's interested in pre-reading, um, yeah, feel free to start reading and playing around with Python parallel processing. All right. Thanks everybody. See you next week. I uh, hope your assignments go really well, and let me know if I can help you out in the forum.